This is the story of Challenger's 8th mission, or STS-51F. The story of STS-51F starts on the 12th of July, 1985. The space shuttle was on the pad and it was ready to go. The space shuttle was carrying Space Lab 2. It was a reusable lab that was developed by the ESA. The shuttle was also carrying a helium-cooled IR telescope and, I kid you not, Pepsi and Coke in specially designed cans so that astronauts could drink Pepsi and Coke in space. Actually, Coke had their can ready to go on an earlier mission and Pepsi asked the Reagan administration to not let Coke be the first cola in space. Anyway, the countdown on the 12th was scrubbed when a coolant valve on engine number 2 of the space shuttle's main RS-25 engines malfunctioned at T-3 seconds. The coolant valve had to partially close for the engine to start up. It had to go from 100% open to 70% open, but this did not happen. They had to abandon their launch attempt, and their next window of opportunity was on the 29th of July 1985, and on the 29th, all readings from the vehicle were healthy. They were a go for launch. At 5 p.m. EDT, after a delay of about an hour and a half, Challenger was on her way to space. The engines ramped up to full power to clear the shuttle of the tower, and as she executed the roll program, they throttled the engines down to 65%. The engines are throttled back at max Q, or maximum aerodynamic pressure, to reduce the loads on the vehicle. Challenger made it through max Q. When it was a little over two nautical miles from the launch pad, Houston came on the frequency and said, Challenger Houston, your go with throttle up, giving them the all clear to push the engines back up to 104%. So far, so good. The APUs and the fuel cells were in the green. One minute and 30 seconds into the flight, all looked good. The shuttle zoomed upward at 2,000 feet per second. A while later, the solid rocket boosters fell away as they had done all that they could to get Challenger into orbit. Five minutes and five seconds had gone by. Still, everything was going according to plan. Suddenly, a voice comes over the radio and says, Stand by for press to ATO, which was quickly followed up by Challenger Houston, press to ATO. Challenger's engine number one had failed and they were told to ATO or reject to orbit. Now, I am using the word reject instead of another word. Just bear with me, okay? ATO was a way to safely reject the launch. In this case, due to the engine failure, they would not be able to reach their intended orbit, and the ATO allowed them to reach a safe, albeit lower orbit, than the targeted orbit. This reject call was made based off of a flurry of activity at Houston, at the Flight Dynamics Console, Two people by the name of Brian Perry and Bruce Hilty had been poring over the ARD, or the Reject Region Determinator. It was a computer that gave them their reject options in the current phase of flight. A person by the name of Jenny Howard monitored the engine parameters that were being beamed down from Challenger. As her data told her the bad news, Jenny Howard called Center Engine Down on the Flight Director Loop. Focus was now on Perry and Bruce. They now had to make the all-important decision on what to do. Challenger at this point was at an altitude of 58 nautical miles and the downrange distance was 275 nautical miles. Challenger was too far away to attempt a return to Kennedy Space Center. Challenger could make it to a lower orbit with two engines, but before they could make that call, Brian Perry and his flight dynamics team had to run some calculations about how the external fuel tank, which was still attached to the shuttle, would impact things. The math checked out, and they made the call to reject this launch and reach a safe lower orbit, and that's how Houston made the ATO call. Once the shuttle crew got the ATO command from Houston, shuttle commander Gordon Fullerton turned a rotary dial in the cockpit to the ATO setting. The shuttle responded by powering up the OMS, or the Orbital Maneuvering System. There are small thrusters on the space shuttle that are used to maneuver in space. The OMS thrusters started burning about 4,400 pounds, or 2,000 kilos of fuel. This provided a negligible amount of thrust to the vehicle, but it did make the shuttle considerably lighter. All of this, from the engine failing to them realizing that the engine had failed, to them doing the math and then dumping the OMS fuel, all of this was done in 25 seconds. Absolutely amazing. Seven minutes into the flight, the shuttle gained TAL capability, meaning that it could now land in Europe, specifically Zaragoza, Spain.
But all was not over. There was the problem of the external fuel tank. Sure, the shuttle could make it to Europe, but for a safe disposal of the external fuel tank, they needed the engines to stay online for a little bit longer as Challenger climbed. The only place to go was up, but no one had experienced this before on a real mission. Sure, they had trained for this, but this was the real deal, and there was a very real risk of losing the crew and the shuttle. Jenny, at this point, made a gamble. She said, flight, limits to inhibit. She was essentially asking the computers to ignore a certain type of warning message from the engines. We'll discuss this in detail later. She had essentially taken away a computerized safety net, and now it was up to a human to monitor the engine data. Nine minutes and 42 seconds after takeoff, Challenger shut her engines down. Challenger was now traveling at 25,760 feet per second, 110 feet away from the target. The external fuel tank then came off. They gave the tank a spin so as to control its descent through the atmosphere. The tank impacted the Indian Ocean south of Australia. NASA's best had performed under pressure. Sure, Challenger was a bit lower than it was supposed to be, but Challenger was safe. Out of 135 shuttle launches, this was the only time where they had to reject the launch to a lower than planned orbit. So before we can dive into what went wrong, we need to go over the basics of rocket engines. Rocket engines, much like jet engines, require fuel. But unlike jet engines, rocket engines need oxidizers to supplement their fuel because there's no oxygen in space. The simplest rocket engine is just a fuel tank and an oxidizer tank with some pressurizing gas and an engine. The fuel and the oxidizer mix and the whole thing ignites and boom, you have thrust. These kinds of engines are very reliable. For example, the ascent stage of the Apollo lunar lander used such an engine because when you're on the surface of the moon, you need that engine to fire no matter what. But these engines have their limits. If you need high thrust, you need high pressures. But the issue with that is that to increase thrust, you'd need to store the fuel and the oxidizer at a higher pressure. That means you'd need stronger and heavier tanks. It also meant that a tank failure was more likely. The solution? Add a fuel pump. The fuel pump will pressurize the fuel so that the fuel in the engine is at a high pressure, but the tanks are not. That's all well and good, but these pumps, or turbo pumps as they are called, need to move and pressurize insane amounts of fuel and oxidizer. On smaller engines, like Rocket Lab's Rutherford engines, you can get away with electric pumps, but on bigger engines, that's just not going to cut it. That's where a pre-burner comes in. The pre-burner is a small combustion chamber in the engine. The pre-burner takes a little bit of fuel and a little bit of oxidizer and burns it. In the process, it'll generate a lot of exhaust. This exhaust turns a turbine, which in turn drives the turbo pumps. The problem with this engine is that you're burning a little bit of fuel to drive the turbo pumps, and that's not translating into thrust. So now what you can do is to take that exhaust and route it into the combustion chamber. But that throws the pressures in the pre-burner out of balance, and it stresses the engine greatly. To get over this issue, they decided to have not one, but two pre-burners. One pre-burner for the fuel loop, and one for the oxidizer loop. In the schematic of the RS-25 engines, used on the space shuttle, you can see that there's a fuel pre-burner and an oxidizer pre-burner. So now you have a fuel pre-burner driving a fuel turbo pump, and an oxidizer pre-burner driving an oxidizer turbo pump. By the way, if you want a more in-depth explanation, Scott Manley has a great video, and I'll link that down below. Okay, great, you're up to speed. Deep inside the RS-25 engine, two platinum wires are used to measure the temperature of the fuel pump. A computer measured the resistance of the wire each second. The hotter the wire was, the higher the resistance. So from this information, the computer could calculate the temperature of the turbo pump. Each engine had two of these temperature sensors, making for six in total on the shuttle. As Challenger climbed, the temperature indicated by sensor A in engine number one climbed up as well. About 100 seconds later, sensor B on engine number one failed. When sensor B failed, the fuel pump temperature readings for engine number one by sensor A was well past the red line. The computer saw that one sensor had failed and one was showing dangerously high values 
and so it shut engine number one down. With that, Challenger continued on to orbit. As the space shuttle approached Europe, they needed both of those engines to work flawlessly to reach the safety of orbit. Soon, a temperature sensor failed in engine number three, and the backup sensor was reading dangerously hot. This was the failure of engine number one all over again. This is when Jenny Howard made the call, flight limits to inhibit. She's basically asking the computers to ignore the data from the sensors and to just keep the engines running. When she made that call, they could not make it to Europe and ditch the external fuel tank safely. At that point, they needed both engines because reaching orbit was the only option that they had. I previously called this a gamble, and it really was. The reason for all of these sensors and computers is so that the computer can shut the engine down as fast as possible so that it does not catastrophically explode if something goes wrong. With those protections gone, a person on the ground now had to monitor the data and call for an engine shutdown as fast as a computer would. So why not just ditch the external fuel tank and land in Europe? A TAL was an option of last resort because it was so dangerous. If you had the option of reaching orbit, that was the way to go. Secondly, you couldn't just jettison the external fuel tank because the tank fed the engines on the shuttle. And since only two engines were running, they'd need to keep those engines running for longer. Lastly, the engine failure moved things around a bit. Since you could not jettison the tank at the point that you usually would, you'd have to wait till it was safe to do so. If you had jettisoned the tank at a random point of the flight, you ran the risk of it falling in a population center. So really, jettisoning the external tank early was out of the question. In the end, they found out that the sensors had failed and that the engines themselves were fine. NASA decided to build a more robust and reliable sensor to fly on future missions. And it worked! This was the only time an engine failed on the space shuttle. So did Jenny and Bruce save the day? Honestly, we don't know. Here's a quote from Tom Holloway from the flight director's office. I think the action she took relative to that last sensor was important. But it might not be correct to say she saved the shuttle, since it's very difficult to know if that sensor would have really shut number three down. But it certainly is correct to say that the call potentially could have saved the shuttle. If we were passing out medals for that day, I think both Howard and Perry would have gotten them. They both just did the right thing and quickly, end quote. Here's a quote from Jenny. I was a little overwhelmed by all of the attention from the news media, she said. I just did not want another engine to go down, and the call to inhibit the limits was made to protect against that. That's our job, end quote. What do you think? Do you think that Jenny and Bruce saved Challenger? Let me know down in the comments below. In the end, the rest of the mission went off without a hitch. The lab met most of its science goals, the telescope did its thing, and yes, the astronauts did get to drink soda in space. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. A big thank you to Marianne Dyson, a former NASA flight director, for answering a few questions that I had. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.